Thank you, everybody. Uh, we're even starting early. This is rare. <clears throat> they know that I'm a compulsive one, and we're uh, always on time, if not early. They call us overpunctual in the uh, German-speaking world. Well, I haven't taught this, I don't think, uh, fully for probably 12 years, so I hope I can uh, say something fresh and refreshing. Uh, but I'm eager to teach it. And uh, the amazing thing to me is that as many years as I've known it now, I, I learned it in the, by accident or providence, I don't know, uh, already in the early 70s, I ended up being one of the first people to learn it for some reason. And uh, here, 30 years later, my appreciation for it would actually uh, be stronger. Uh, I'm more convinced there's some amazing truth at work here. And of course, psychologists and therapists and scientists have all been putting out books, you see many of them over here, uh, trying to say, how can this be true? How can it be so true? Because scientifically, uh, we can't prove it. It really is a classic example of a wisdom tradition, an oral tradition, uh, that seems to have been lost for many years. Uh, in the book, the, the Christian Perspective, I'm trying to trace some of the history again, and I'm convinced it has originally Christian foundations among the Desert Fathers, and then a Franciscan connection in the, in the 12th, 13th century by a man called Raymond Lull, who was a master evangelist, made eight trips to the uh, world that we would now think of, the of as the Muslim world, and he was trying to find a lingua franca, whereby as an evangelist he could talk to the Muslim world and he could talk to the Christian world and would not offend either one of them. All right? uh, an almost neutral language of conversion or transformation. He got lost in his Ars Magna, his huge set, almost as great as Thomas Aquinas's, in Latin, and uh, really uh, wasn't known. And then got rediscovered. Those good Jesuits brought it back to the, uh, the West in the early 70s, and I happened to have a Jesuit spiritual director at that time in Cincinnati who taught it to me. And in those first years, we were told we had to keep it an absolute secret. Uh, it was only because they didn't want it to be trivialized. It was uh, only to be taught uh, from spiritual director to spiritual director because they thought... Uh, that once it became, as it has become, a parlor game, its power would be lost. And now the books pour out. They speak of the Enneagram industry. <laughs> uh, but I didn't uh, even tape it, even though my friends say I don't have an untaped thought. Uh, and uh, yet Helen Palmer came out with her book in the uh, early 80s, or mid-80s, I think it was. And I said, okay, the secret's out. And so the next time I taught it, also in the mid-80s, uh, that was put on tape, and that's the set that uh, made me known in these circles. It's interesting that, uh, and I say this just to help you understand the longing of the world. I hope it doesn't sound like I'm uh, bragging or something, but I keep being invited to give the keynote address or a major address at these international Enneagram conventions. And I've only accepted it twice, but um, I have to give them a polite excuse uh, every other year or so. And uh, I said to one of them, I said, why do you keep inviting me? I've said whatever I have to say. I do think I, I sort of know it uh, intuitively at this point. <clears throat> but uh, it amazed me that because it has moved into the business world, it's moved into the education world, it's moved all over the world. In fact, my book tends to be much bigger selling in other languages than in, than in English. Um, but uh, uh, we, I said, why do you want me to talk about it? And the answer is always the same, that even these people who have taken it to rather uh, wonderful but secular levels are recognizing that it's lost much, much of its power and that their desire, why they keep inviting me back, is they say, bring us back to the spiritual foundation. Now that's the tack I'm gonna be giving you today, which I believe is the original one, and I believe is the authentic uh, approach to the Enneagram. It was 
a spiritual tradition uh, uh, totally, entirely. And the years of refinement seem to have been done in the world that we would now call Syria, Afghanistan, Iraq, Iran, uh, where the Sufi schools of spiritual direction took what I believe was the original capital sins of the Desert Fathers and refined them and made them subtle and helped to understand the patterns between them. Then Raymond Lull, in my opinion, I can't prove all of this, but it's the only links in the chain we can rediscover, uh, seems to have brought it back from the Middle East and the Sufi schools of spiritual direction to the Christian West, but then it got lost in his Latin texts and uh, no one uh, bothered with it. But anyway, we've got it again. And uh, it's, uh, I hope, I hope will be a gift for you. And you see the title that I gave it this time is, I believe, a return to its original understanding and even a biblical understanding, the Enneagram as the discernment of spirits. Now, let me spend a little time on that. That word itself might be uh, one not totally familiar to you. In the 12th chapter of 1 Corinthians, Paul speaks of discernment as one of the charismata, one of the original charisms that are absolutely essential for this mystery called church. Uh, the discrimination of spirits, if you will. Uh, the recognition of the subtlety of the nature of evil. And uh, he, he seemed to think, as uh, many spiritual directors have recognized over the centuries, if you don't recognize the subtle character of evil, you will be overcome by it. Because huh? it's never obvious. I want to actually use, I think the timing on this is good, uh, the uh, Lord of the Rings phenomenon. I don't know how many of you are J.R.R. Tolkien fans, but the, the original books are a study in the nature of evil and the subtlety of evil. For all of the grandiosity of the three movies, I don't think they approach the book <laughs> because all the American mind is ready for is spectacle. We love spectacle. But, you know, Aristotle said way back when that the, the very meaning of drama was that drama had to have character development and plot development. And you had to see the, the subtle relationship between plot and character. And he said the thing that would destroy that subtlety would be spectacle. All right? Already, I mean, 2,500 years ago, huh? that you get caught up in the spectacular, huh? Uh, a, a war, a battle drama that takes an hour and 10 minutes in the movie where there's absolute good and absolute evil, which is entirely untrue to what Tolkien is saying. Now, the amazing thing is that most of America is totally happy and gaga over these movies because we like spectacles. But my point here is we no longer understand the discernment of spirits that, that Tolkien is representing. We don't understand subtlety. We like spectacle. And that's what we're speaking into when we talk about the Enneagram. Why most people uh, trivialize the Enneagram, too, because we're not ready for subtlety. And especially that, that evil has to disguise itself. Huh? Uh, you know, the very word Lucifer, you know, it means the light bearer. Right? The light bearer, the one who carries light. Evil never looks like evil. That's why presidents can sell wars, okay? Because <laughs> most people are into spe the spectacular huh? and have no ability to discern anything with any kind of degree of subtlety. Huh? And so we continually get sucked into evil. Huh? The quote that was put at the top of your schedule, and that is actually at the beginning of my book, is that marvelous line from Corinthians. Huh? The angels of darkness must disguise themselves as angels of light. Huh? That is sort of the byline in the understanding of, of the Enneagram. Huh? That, that evil will always look like good. And that's the only reason any of us will do evil. Because huh? we will have ourselves convinced that it's moral, 
upstanding, patriotic, uh, making the world safe for democracy or something like that. We'll create some rationale uh, to justify our, our doing of evil. Rilke, the wonderful German speaking poet, put it well. And maybe this is a good one line description of the process. Unless you tame your demons, you will never know your angels. I do encourage you to be taking notes because I'm going to be saying a lot today and most of this is going to be lost by the end of the day if you aren't taking notes on some of this stuff. Unless you tame your demons, you will never know your angels. Now, we're not into, although the West is, but here we're not, we're not into killing demons. In the Enneagram, the genius of it, and this is where it's uniquely Christian, we are going to make the devil work for God, okay? We're going to make the devil work for God. That's the genius of it. Uh, this, this model of the total overcoming of evil is what we have in spectacles. You know? Total good guy, total bad guy. But the, the learning that this energy, which can be used for evil, which in, in the Lord of the Rings is precisely the ring. A ring isn't a bad thing. It, it's attractive, all right? You put it on your finger. For us, it's a sign of commitment. But if you've read uh, the Lord of the Rings, all right, the ring is the symbol of power from beginning to end. And, and in the subtlety of, of the real story, it's, it's a temptation to everybody in the movie. You'll see people with initial gifts and then the contact with the ring becomes the temptation to misuse their gift for evil purpose. Even the hobbits who come off crystal clean in the movie are, are, are all touched by evil in the, in the original, because you cannot not be touched by it. You cannot not struggle with the temptations of power and the misuse of power. And everybody does. Huh? Everybody. There's no exceptions. Huh? Even in the movie, you re return to the Shire at the end if you've seen it and everything's idyllic and technicolor and beautiful. That's not true in the book. Frodo returns to the Shire and he says, this is now as bad as the world of mortals, right? And the great temptation, the greatest temptation in the movie is to try to create an absolutely perfect world, right? That's the illusion of Genesis already. <laughs> to refuse to live with, with the tainted, broken, original sin and to struggle with it. That's what created communism, right? An ideological power way to create perfection, supposedly, from the top. To take away all injustice, huh? I mean, communism all started with, forgive me, peace and justice people, all right? <laughs> People who are very liberal, as it were, right? all wanted peace and justice and thought they could attain peace and justice by power. Uh, and, and if you see the subtlety of, of, of the discernment of spirits, it's always pointing out and revealing that subtlety. That as soon as you try to bring about even good things by enforcement, domination, or power, they become a bad thing. But most people can't see that. We can now kill people because we're making the world safe for terrorists. Huh? Uh, safe against terrorists, excuse me. <laughs> Maybe safe for them. Maybe that was right. I don't know. But, but see, now that's good. That's all good. And all discrimination stops, you know. All discernment stops. Even though at a conference I was just at, a moral theologian pointed out how this war doesn't meet a single criterion of the just war. Cannot be justified on any historic level. Huh? But... You know, most of our good Christian, Catholic, every Sunday go to church people, bought it lock, stock, and barrel hmm? because they have no discernment of spirits. Hmm? They have no ability to discriminate, no ability to recognize uh, the real nature of evil and the real nature of good. I want to say that at the beginning, maybe putting it in too dramatic context to help you understand what we're up against. If we don't teach this kind of discrimination, I think the world will continue uh, to sell itself out to evil. Hmm? Paul says uh, in uh, Colossians, he stripped the, 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 patri uh, the uh, principalities and powers of their phony authority and marched them naked through the streets in his triumph. Hmm? 
So stripping them right, and marching them through the streets is what we're about. It's not killing them. right? You strip them. You expose them for what they are. That's what Martin Luther King was doing. That's what Gandhi was doing. Huh? Make evil show itself. <laughs> Make the, the policemen of Birmingham, you know, uh, impose their, their uh, water cannons on us and make them show that they are people of power, not of peace. This is the ultimate overcoming of evil, to make evil show itself for what it is. Now, that's why the Enneagram has been called in many ways a negative system. I'll try to make it entertaining today, but in some ways it isn't entertaining. No? I'm going to make fun of every one of you in this room. Huh? And in fact, if you don't suffer that humiliation, if you don't squirm a little bit and say, oh God, he got me, that's me. And that's what I don't want anybody to know. That's what I've always been ashamed of and that's what you're, I'm trying to cover up. Huh? If you don't feel that by the time you leave here at six o'clock, then you, you didn't get it, right? You didn't get it. <laughs> if you leave here feeling good about yourself, you didn't get it, all right? <laughs> You have to feel bad about yourself first. Huh? As many have said, uh, yes, the truth will set you free, but first it will make you miserable. Huh? <laughs> so today we're into making you miserable. <clears throat> That's my work. Huh? So the gift of recognizing spirits or distinguishing between spirits, uh, translate it the way you want, is one of the named and original charisms of the Holy Spirit. Without it, and I do believe few people have been trained in it, we constantly confuse good with evil. We call good evil, as Isaiah says, and we call evil good. This has to do, and this is what I'm going to be trying to train you in today, with a, a learning to recognize energies much more than superficial external traits. Now, the only way I'm going to be able to teach this is by uh, giving examples of external traits. And a lot of you are going to stop right there. And that's when it becomes a parlor game, you know. She's an artist, therefore she's a four. That's too simple. Far too simple, you know. Some fours are not artistic at all. It must be very hard to be a four if you're not artistic. But there, I actually know some, you know, who aren't, who aren't naturally creative, but they think in that way inside. They just haven't learned how to translate it into the outer world, you see. So don't look for traits. You want to look for motivations. What's their real form of perception? You're going to find that you, you all take your reality in through a chosen set of blinders. And we're going to try to explain why there's nine. I know some of you say, why not eight? Why not six? Why not seven? Why not 15? And there will be those of you walking out the door at six o'clock and saying, oh, I'm a perfect 10. No, there's nine. <laughs> I don't know why there's nine. <laughs> well, I do partially know, but I'll say it later. Huh? Um, but uh, we're going to teach through the traits, but don't get lost in the external traits. Huh? They're just partial giveaways. And when you get good at it, you, you read energies. I mean, really. And this is the reason that Helen Palmer got into it. She told me herself. I mean, she was a, a, a psychic intuitive. Huh? And she's convinced that you can train people to be psychic. Well, that's what this was about initially. We didn't use that kind of word in the early centuries, but it was training people to read the soul. How to read the soul. Huh? And, and how to pick up, after a while, you can pick it up by their body movements, by their gestures, by their face, by, I mean, my God. Uh, and the more compulsive a person is, the more easy they are to read. Uh, you can probably see already that I'm a one. I'm chopping the air with my gestures, you know. That's the way we do it. We're always chopping reality up somehow, you know, because that gives us some ability to control it. And here I've known this dang thing for 30 years, and I'm still a one. So... I hope that gives you a bit of compassion with yourself and consolation. Uh, I know some of you won't like the determinism of this, but, and I don't know why it's true, but you're one number. And you're going to be that until the day you die. I don't know why, you know. But I think it's the shape and the name of what the Christian tradition called original sin. Huh? I'm convinced of it. Huh? That, that precisely there's a primary flaw 
and, and there seem to be nine basic shapes to this flaw. A primary uh, ill perception. And, and we're, we're addicted to it is the trouble. We're attached to it. That's why you won't let go of it. All you can do is move it to some level of consciousness, which on my first tapes I called the level of redemption, where you see through it. You, you, you laugh at it. And I'm going to try to help you laugh at it today, because until you can laugh at it, you're not going to be free from it. You see, if you try to attack it, you know what you'll do. Right? You will attack it with the same energy that you are, which will only double the energy, right? In other words, I try to make myself not a one by being a one. <laughs> you, that's the only way I know how to do anything, you know? So I approach my oneness with oneness. That's driving out the devil by the prince of devils, to use Jesus' language, all right? <laughs> which is the only way the world understands. So we're going to overcome Iraq by Iraq's methods, which makes us Iraq in mirror energy, no one can see that except people of discernment and people of, of spiritual understanding. Huh? Without it, you can have three PhDs, all right? And you won't see it. You won't. That's why conversion and repentance was tied up not with education, but with transformation. Education is not the same as transformation. Education is not the same as conversion. In the spiritual life, in fact, having three PhDs here, I'm saying this on a college campus where Dominicans are in charge, you know, but uh, education in the spiritual life is not necessarily an advantage. In fact, good Franciscan tradition would say it's very often a disadvantage huh? because it gives you, in fact, more trust in your head that you can figure this out, right? that you can explain this and control this and understand this. Huh? So transformation, repentance, conversion is on a very different track than, than mere education. Now, I, I, could, I think we could say that the Enneagram is a psychological explanation of what the church calls original sin. Although, I want to counter that right away by saying that this is not primarily psychological. <laughs> we in the West tend to, uh, after the last century, since Freud especially, we tend to like the psychological categories. And we think that they're almost the final explanation. No offense to the therapists in the room, <laughs> but as many others have said, all problems are today interpreted psychologically in America, but the real solutions are almost always spiritual. Huh? Spiritual is a bigger realm than psychological because the individual psyche is precisely that. It's too individualistic. It's too tiny. It's too small. It's text outside of context. Huh? It's individual outside of participation. And, and that's good as far as it goes. But a therapist without some contact with cosmos uh, with what we would call spirituality, it really doesn't have that much finally to say. Huh? So anyway, the, the Enneagram seems to have been a recognition in Christianity and especially in Sufi Islam, uh, although it took the form in the Jewish Kabbalah too. Huh? So all three monotheistic religions seem to have, have recognized its wisdom historically. They, they said that there is a a primary blindness in each of us. By today's words, we'd probably call it a primary addiction. And what we're addicted to, sorry to say, although happy to say, is primarily yourself, right? It's called egocentricity. And until that egocentricity, that foundational egocentricity is broken, I have no reason to believe that you will not read all of life through personal self-interest, right? And that's why I can't even fashion this in terms of self-growth, right? Because <laughs> if, if, and that's where I, I would say most of the teachers are teaching it today. And what does that do? That appeals to your self-interest, right? How can I grow, right? <laughs> How can I become more whole? Uh, 
I don't even read me on that level because that's not the level in which we're going to be talking today. That might happen. In fact, it will happen as a corollary. But uh, do understand it as a corollary. It's just a sort of side advantage. Now, oh, we, uh, perhaps you remember it in the Christian tradition, we did speak of seven capital sins. Though, although Raymond Lull and Evagrius Ponticus and others, they had eight already. And it's very interesting that in all three historic paradigms that I just mentioned, the one that is missing in every case is what we now call the sixth type or fear. You know why? Because fear is so omnipresent in all of our lives. Fear is so constant and universal. Fear is the almost exact opposite of faith. We're all living inside of our fears to some degree that none of the ancients seem to be able to recognize fear for the unique capital sin that it also is. In other words, there are some people, and ironically, it's the biggest number of all. Many teachers that I'm working with say that 50% of the human race are sixes, right? <laughs> at least. It's, it's by far the biggest number. Um, it, it, we, we recognize that, that we couldn't see it. We just couldn't see it because it, it was everywhere. There are just some people who make an art form out of it. I mean, they, <laughs> they really just see everything through their fears, and uh, it's no worse the, uh, a trap than any other one. But the trouble is it gets a lot of confirmation, uh, a lot of affirmation. It's called patriotism. It's called militarism. It's called church. It's called dogma. It's called doctrine. I mean, who can knock all that stuff? Religion and military is sort of what makes the world go round. Well, you want to know why? Uh, because sick religion and sick militarism both appeal to the fear type. Huh? Basically, people who cannot trust themselves huh, and so need to belong to a larger, absolutely sure system that is never wrong, like the Roman Catholic Church or the American government. Do you see? I will sell my soul to the church. I will sell my soul to the American government so I don't have to take responsibility for my life. Now, that's a great temptation uh, and for all of us, I think, but particularly for a, a fear-based person. Now, these energies, <coughs> these natural flows within us are hidden. They're deep. They were called passions by the medieval masters. And one had to discern his or her true passion or juice or energy source. And therefore, they were pretty much associated with sin, your passions. It probably still has that, that negative connotation in most Catholics' minds anyway. But it was called his, his blindness, uh, his compulsiveness would probably be the psychological word we'd use today. It actually, see, too much of a good thing is a bad thing. You can write that down, right? <laughs> and, and what you do when you're young is you over-identify with what you're naturally good at. Why wouldn't you? Huh? You, you, you play your gift for all it's worth. That's what the teenage years basically mean. And you have to do it. It's the only way to grow up. <laughs> you, you play your strong suit. Huh? You play what works for you. Why wouldn't you? You find a style that impresses people or gets you the friendship you want or the security that you want or the power that you want or the control that you want. By the time you're in your 20s, you're expert at it. You're just real good. You're gliding on your gift. Why would you stop it, you know? By that point, it's got you your job. It got you through school. It got you your wife. You know, I mean, it worked. Huh? There's just no reason at that point to stop doing it. Huh? Without being thrown off your horse, you won't. Huh? And that's why we say that somewhere in the middle of life's journey, as Dante put it, I enter into the dark wood, huh? or find myself in the dark wood. <clears throat> that has to happen spiritually, where hopefully, ideally, most commonly, 
in the present time. It happened somewhere in the 30s. If you're not too rich and too good looking and too famous, if you're too rich and too good looking and too famous, you'll keep pushing it off till your 40s or 50s or 60s or, or maybe forever. So those of you who are not real good looking and real rich and real famous, you've got a great big head start, all right? <laughs> Or if you've suffered some kind of failure in your life, or some kind of humiliation, or some kind of sin. Uh, I, at the beginning of my second book on it, I, I quote uh, Meister Eckhart, got to quote one Dominican here today. Meister Eckhart says, one should not repent too much. The value of sin is very great. Wow, no wonder we condemned him, you know, and called him a heretic. <laughs> But listen to Jesus then, to the rich young man. Why do you call me good? God alone is good. Stop this good stuff. Just stop it, you know, that I'm good. You're not. And I'm going to show you why you're not today, all right? You're not that good. None of you, all right? Well, the, the best thing you do is for very selfish motives, all right? You do it to look good, right? You do it to succeed. You do it to get power. You do it to get people to like you. And I do too. And it's just terrible. You know, <laughs> but when you stop hating yourself, even for that, and you say, I've met the enemy and the enemy is me, and I guess I'm stuck with it. And apparently for some reason, it's called the gospel. God likes it. I guess I can work with it. If God's willing to work with it, I guess I will too, you know, or Paul's wonderful line in Romans, huh? Romans 5, 21, where sin abounds, the Lutherans love this, of course, where sin abounds, grace abounds even more. Wow, good line, huh? Where sin abounds, that's the breakthrough point for grace. Of course it is, huh? And the Enneagram's going to make that very clear. And then my favorite mystic, Julian of Norwich. First the fall, then the recovery from the fall. And both are the mercy of God. First the fall, and then the recovery from the fall. And both are the mercy of God. None of us were told that the first fall was also the mercy of God. Because huh? it's the hole in the soul, as the alcoholics say. It's the thing that breaks you open. It's got to happen. Sin and salvation are correlative terms. And you don't understand the meaning of salvation. That's why it's sort of useless. To, and I started there working with teenagers in Cincinnati in 1970. Uh, you know, preaching the full gospel to 16-year-olds. They love it, you know, but they don't do much with it because they haven't sinned yet. You understand? <laughs> they, they don't hate themselves enough yet. Huh? They haven't fallen into the hole yet. They haven't found themselves in the dark wood yet. They haven't gone into that endless capacity, as now and called it, for self-rejection. And, and only then does the consoling word of good news and unconditional love begin to have redemptive effect or begin to make sense. So my goal here is not character building, sorry. Right? It's not personality development, sorry. I, I know that's what after the last 40 years we've all grown used to. And frankly, it's why, I mean, we could have offered this to a thousand people this weekend and would have filled it up because they all think it's personality development and character enrichment, you know? <laughs> and Americans love that, or self-knowledge. Now, it's going to give you some self-knowledge. Huh? It's going to give you some character development. But it's almost going to happen on the side, almost by accident. And you're going to know then it's a grace. It was given. It won't come from your effort. It won't come from you figuring it out or working it out. My goal, and that'll be my bias, I hope, the whole day, is to move you toward a contemplative awareness a transformation of consciousness much more than a development of consciousness. Let me repeat that. A transformation of consciousness much more than a development of consciousness. And not uh, at all development uh, of, of ego, but in fact, humiliation of ego. Just the opposite of the way the American mind thinks. Huh? A new mind instead of a newly informed mind which is what I'm sure you want to leave here today with all kind of new information, and maybe you will. But it won't be the information itself that will convert you uh, unless it subverts you 
And if it subverts you, then it has the possibility to, to lead you to that new consciousness. So all I can do today is inform the calculative mind, as I call it, which is your normal, educated, psychological mind that all of you operate out of. I'm going to inform that mind so it will stop trusting itself so much, stop relying on itself so much, stop thinking it can figure it out, and you'll let go of the calculative mind. That's my term in the book, Everything Belongs. The two big minds, the calculative mind and the contemplative mind. And until you subvert the calculating mind, normally you cannot fall into the new consciousness, which we call the contemplative mind. Too much concern for self-development or ego development or personal self-knowledge will actually keep you inside of the calculating mind. So we just need a strong enough sense of ourselves, and this is the task of the first half of life. You need a strong enough sense of yourself to finally confront total reality. So it seems that, that we use our, what Ernest Becker calls our character armor. Now some of you are going to ask, well, where did this character armor come from? Is it nature? Is it nurture? Did my mom do it to me? Uh, did my dad do it to me? Did America do it to me? I, the only honest answer I can give is I don't know. I really don't know. But I know you get it real early, right? <laughs> and the answer I've been given over in Europe is just to, to resolve the dualistic split. I just say it's one-third nature, one-third nurture, and one-third free choice. Maybe at a minimal level of freedom. But I can remember, as a little boy already, wanting to be a good boy. Right? Wanting to be a little goody two-shoes and doing everything right. right? <laughs> That's a one. Right? Now, uh, no doubt, I was preconditioned for that. Uh, by my mother, especially. you know, <laughs> And no doubt, my Catholic... Uh, experience told me that you should be a good boy. So I had all these wonderful justifications for being a good boy, you know. But in fact, I chose it, I think, at some level of subliminal consciousness. So I hand you that for whatever it's worth or however it might help you. What the anagram wants to say, you can write this down, <laughs> you are destroyed by your gift. You are destroyed by your gift. No one ever thought of that, right? <laughs> the very thing that you think is your strong point is the thing you will over-identify with. It becomes your set of blinders. You overplay your cards. And normally, by the middle of the 30s, it should start showing itself to you. A lot of people in the early years started teaching this to high school kids, and it goes right over their heads. All it can be is a parlor game, huh? because, again, they haven't sinned enough yet. Huh? Jesus has this wonderful line, many lines in Jesus, shows he understood this basic pattern of discernment and disguise. He said, the stone that the builder rejects is, in fact, the cornerstone. In the building, in the constructing of your personality, your ego, your successful persona, huh? There have been a few things that you decided to eliminate. Huh? Like, I don't ever want to look like I'm bad. I don't want to ever look like I'm selfish, because that wouldn't fit my uh, public image. Of, you know, especially now, being a priest, it's even worse. You, know? you can see why so many people get trapped. Uh, but each one of you has a certain thing that you reject. We call it the shadow self now. Huh? It's not really the evil self. It's simply the unacceptable self. If you're a three, you just cannot accept uh, public humiliation and failure. You've got to look good. And so you become an efficiency expert. At just, you know, organizing, mechanizing, greasing the wheels of life and everything. So you always look like this, this uh, knight on a white horse, you know, <laughs> a fair-haired boy who can do everything right. And you are. But you aren't. <laughs> and so God, somewhere in, 
your life has to get you off that white charger. So you stop charging into life and help you see that the stone that you rejected, you're weeping over failure, your acceptance of failure, that you're a little man like everybody else. That has to happen to you. And that will become the cornerstone, the cornerstone of your, your strong and true and integrated personality. That's it in one line. You can leave now. You've got it. All right? <laughs> Nothing more to teach you all day. All right? uh, the two wants to think of himself as so loving. You know? and, and he or she has got to weep over the recognition that all of his lovingness is to get people to love him back. You know? Oh my God, that's humiliating for a two. Hmm? To recognize that all of their attempts to serve and to help are from a self-centered purpose. Hmm? Until they face that they, they, that, they will not find the cornerstone that builds the integrated and beautiful personality that they can be and they will be. Now, do you see what we're up against? in an arrogant culture like ours, which never wants to face humiliation because our whole country is three energy. America is a three country. Poor threes have a hard time getting converted if you're an American because it's called uh, success. It's the only name of the game. It's, it's the American typology. The whole world sees it. Huh? Except once you fly into the United States, you can't see it anymore. <laughs> Oh, I was so glad when the war started, I was out of the country, you know, and you could hear it. Oh, there go those Americans again with simplistic answers, you know, for complex things. Because that's the way the three reads life. Always very simplistically, good and bad. So if you're unwilling to bear, to carry that ego humiliation that comes in the middle of life, sometimes earlier, sometimes later, you will not move toward total reality. Now, when I say total reality today equals God, right? same thing. That's we who are believers simply use the word God, but people who don't believe, they'll use the word total reality, perhaps, or force or something else. The irony is, brothers and sisters, that we actually frustrate in ourselves and for ourselves what we want the most. I don't know why we do this. This is what's damnable about human nature. We really are our own worst enemy. We're a living contradiction, it seems, acting at cross purposes to our own best intents and purposes. We need to know how we are our own worst enemy. And that's what I'm going to try to help you see today, so that you can flow with your gift and, and, and also integrate your sin, your shadow, your failure, that which you're afraid of, the stone which you have rejected. The contradictions that we are must be overcome by both affirming them and countering them almost simultaneously. Affirming that, that, that broken side as, as the place of the wound. And that's why we are the religion of the wound that says it's through the wound that we are healed, through the wound that we come to God. This is the art form of the Enneagram. It simply teaches you how to do that. In that sense, I'm just amazed that some people can think this is New Age or pagan. Uh, it's, just, it's anything but. Huh? It, it, it's, it's Christian to the core in my understanding of it. But it's at a level of Christianity that I think, frankly, an awful lot of Christians have not wanted to go. We've all created a survival strategy. We've all created a, a strategic self, a marketable self, a personal manager hmm, that we have to fire. Hmm. And this personal manager is in rather total control of you. Hmm. And he has told you how to manage yourself for so many years, you don't want to fire him. Because hmm, he's sort of working. What we hope for is that he fails. Teresa of Avila had so many wonderful lines, but she said, the sinner is actually one who does not love himself or herself enough. She, he or she does not see or, or admire this whole self that we are 
And so we split. We try to love the good self and reject the bad self, and we get into this dualism that characterizes most Western people. Instead of this suffering of reality, this, this bearing of the burden of the two sides of the mystery that we are, Allowing, as Jesus puts it in Matthew 13, the field of weeds and wheat to grow together until the harvest. That's a, a one-liner from Jesus himself. So don't report me to the bishop, all right? <laughs> Let the weeds and wheat grow together until the harvest. And don't go and try to pull out the weeds. Because huh? if you do, Jesus says, you'll destroy the wheat along with it. My God, that's brilliant. Why didn't we hear that? Huh? Because the, the calculating mind is always a dualistic mind. It only can read reality in terms of either or. Good guys, bad guys, absolute evil and absolute good. That's why Peter Jackson did what he did with Tolkien's book. Huh? That's the best he can do. Hmm? Is spectacular battle scenes. Huh? And, and that reflects the, the readiness of our mind, I think. We must notice, brothers and sisters, how we each block ourselves by a preferred style of perception. A preferred style of perception. And that style of perception has become your way of getting your energy. And it works for you. But what I want to point out, if I can today, is to use a physical image, it's white gas. You know, it'll... Your car can go on it, but it's finally going to destroy the car. <laughs> and it ain't going to drive real well on cheap gas. Huh? And what we're going to try to do today is take that white gas out <laughs> and at least show you how to get access with uh, ethyl supreme that doesn't knock or whatever. You know, the real good stuff. Huh? Uh, it, it seems that what we do, we actually subvert. And this has to be our original sin. We actually subvert our pleasure and our enjoyment. I'm going to say this, and this will sound too naive to some of you, but it'll make sense, I hope, by the end of the day. If you're not enjoying life at a foundational level, you're not doing it right. You're involved in this approach avoidance, going with the energy and attacking it and hating yourself for it, always at the same time. Most people I know live with one foot on the accelerator and one foot on the brake. Do you see? The guilt and the shame and the fear that they've all been trying. I shouldn't be this way, but I am, but I don't know how to get rid of it. I'll just keep confessing it or hating myself for it, huh? which profits you nothing. When you're living life right, you will enjoy life. I'm not saying there won't be sufferings and difficulty and hardships, but even underneath those, there's a foundational happiness, a foundational contentment that I am who I am and it's okay. And God is using all of me, all of me to bring me to God. And I don't spend any time now splitting or projecting or avoiding or denying because it is what it is and I am what I am, good and bad put together into one self. And God's mercy is so great and God's love is so total that God uses even your sin in your favor, right? That's it. God will use even your so-called dark side to bring you to God. Tell me what the gospel would be if it's not that. Tell me. What would be good news? All the rest of it is not good news. Most of it has been handed to me as good news is bad news. Because it's still based on somehow getting rid of something that, damn it, I can't get rid of, right? And so you just live with this terrible, constant self-hatred, which has almost come to be the characteristic of the West. Huh? This constant, deep self-hatred and self-rejection. Huh? The sinner is actually one who does not love himself or herself enough. And so I hope on the other side we can increase this love of yourself, of, what you, who, of this self that almost appears like a self-created cartoon character. And, and we're going to make it look like a cartoon. I'm going to make simplistic jabs at all of them today. But maybe all 100% all of it doesn't apply to you. But 
I'll bet 10% does, probably 60%. Huh? And here's what's even worse. Your compulsive self is actually what people admire you for. <laughs> it's what people applaud you for. It's how you got your job. All right? It's what made you look good. So why change it? Unless you really want the truth. Unless you really want God. And that's why it's very hard to convert people in the first half of life. You're mostly wasting your time up to 35. Forgive me for you young ones, you know, but uh, it's just, hey, I got to ride it for a while yet, you know, and you've got to let them ride it for a while. But it's why you sort of roll your eyes at your teenagers sometimes, you know, oh, God, he's going down such a dead end, but he's got to do it, you know. <laughs> And you just hope you can contain them enough or hold them enough that they don't self-destruct. But by my age, you just see right through what most young people are doing. It's just, okay, I did it too. And someone held on to me, you know, someone uh, believed in me or loved me. Now, let's start moving into the three big areas. That's a big overview. I'll keep coming back to it in various forms. As you know, the, the nine types, let's draw our big circle up here that you've seen many times. Look at that, pretty good. All right. If you want to know why they're nine, by the way, it's because, and this has been confirmed and reconfirmed on so many levels, psychological, spiritual, traditional teaching, because the three Trinitarian parts, and it does mirror Trinity, by the way, of the human person are uh, mind right, and spirit and heart. Now, there's different words used for that, and I'll, I'll give you some of those different words. But in some way or another, those seem to be the three parts of the person. And before you hone in on your deliberate number, I want you to see the, the traps of the three areas in particular, how you can be trapped in the head, how you can be trapped in the heart, and how you can be trapped uh, in the gut or the body, if you want to call it that, really. Now, the pure entrapment. When I was first taught, it, uh, these poor people, are, uh, they have a double compulsion. You're all going to hate yourself if you're one of these numbers. If you're a nine, if you're a three, or if you're a six. Those are the pure sins, if you will, <laughs> in concentrated, distilled form. Because you see why even they're what we're going to call the wings, it doesn't make sense yet, but the numbers on each side of you are even your wings are inside of that compulsive space. These people, these gut people, are all into their body self, their instinctive self. We call it gut. And the response to reality is an immediate gut response to it. These heart people are all into their feelings and their emotions and what other people think of them and how other people respond to them. And, and the poor three in the middle, he, that's all he or she has is what are people going to think? What are people going to, are they going to love me? Or gonna, they gonna, are they going to admire me? Are they going to promote me? And the poor six is totally into their head which they, of course, call common sense or something like that, you know. But, uh, but the, the head becomes their absolute security system and their absolute control tower, where they're constantly defending themselves from reality. Now, what I want to say at this early point is that all three of these in their generalized form substitute their game for authentic contact with what is. The head people substitute thought and thought systems and patterns of thought that they've now become used to for authentic contact with reality, for what is, for educated feeling, deep, honest, holistic intuition. So they never really connect with what is on an instinctual, honest level. It's always via their head trip. Got it? <laughs> Everything goes first to the mind, and then if it passes muster up there, maybe they'll actually meet you. <laughs> no, not you, but the categories of you, or my fear of you, or my explanation of you. 
Now, we all do this, by the way. But again, they had people have just made an art form out of it, which is why any contemplative teacher or prayer teacher is trying to tell you to disassociate with this damn head. Because the head is the ultimate control tower, and the head can't get you there. You cannot be present to what is through your head. Let me repeat that. You cannot be present to what is through your head. <laughs> but head people think they can, and that finally becomes a paralysis for them. Heart people, you'd think these are all gushy, little, feeling, warm people. Well, yes, but no. I'm going to say something that's going to seem actually shocking. These so-called feeling people, two, three, and four, they don't have feelings at all. You know why? Because they have everybody else's. They don't know what they really feel. That's why the four is striving to be authentic. That's why the three is doing this endless dance to try to live up to everybody else's feeling response or a feeling need for them. Huh? And why the two is constantly, you know, running into your world and invading your space to try to help you uh, because they don't know who they are. And so they've got to pretend that they know who you are and what you need. Huh? So again, even the heart person doesn't really contact what is, what's right in front of them. Huh? They look like feeling people, but they're one step removed and a very significant step removed from authentic contact with reality. It is always via other people's feelings, which are themselves pseudo feelings, usually, <laughs> do you understand? So we're walking around with our phony feelings, and then the three is taking those on well, the poor three, no wonder, you know, he, he is so insecure and so unstable on many levels because he's two steps removed from reality. Then finally, before the break, let me say the same thing about myself, us gut people. Oh, we're a case, you know. <laughs> what we do is we absolutely abort our contact with reality, which is experienced through authentic feelings. Now, that needs education. Don't take that too glibly, you know. By making previous judgments as to the meaning of the event. Hmm? And that previous judgment is held in our body. We have an immediate like or dislike for everything. Everything. Oh, I wish I weren't that way. We immediately know whether it's okay or it isn't okay. All right. <laughs> Reality comes at us gut people like a shock wave. Just one shock wave after the other. Never, everything is too much for us. It's, ah, 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 how do I relate to that? How do I, because we take it on like a full body blow, you know? So, so what we do is we once decide, okay, I'll just control it and be perfect all the time. And I'll just relate to good people, you know, or I'll just be a good person or something. I don't know what we do. What the eight does is just punch it out. Just keep punching it out, attacking it back. Get out of my way. Get out of my way. Because I can't take it. And the nine, or the honest, they just, oh my God, it's too much. <laughs> and so they just back off. Yeah? So you see how it's the pure form? It's just too much, this, this full body blow every three minutes. You've got to know that to understand gut people. Life is a full body blow every three minutes. And we've learned a survival technique to try to contain that much energy. Yeah? So there you got it. Now, that's very oversimplified, but I wanted to give you the big picture before we uh, now move into the parts. A goodness grown to a pleurisy dies in its own too much. <laughs> a goodness grown to a pleurisy dies in its own too much. That's what we're saying. And Shakespeare knew it. Of course, he was a four. And, and fours have this amazing ability to naturally discern spirits. Both fours and fives do. They're the best at it. Some of us have found great wisdom in recent uh, years by Eckhart Tolle's wisdom from the power of now. I want to read a quote from him about this loving of our own unhappiness, this attachment to our own unhappiness. He calls it the pain body. And he says, we live inside of our own pain body and we choose it. Most human beings would rather be in pain, be the pain body, 
than take a leap into the unknown and risk losing the familiar but unhappy self. <laughs> the familiar but unhappy self. We would rather have the familiar and the habitual than pay the price of liberation. He says, observe the peculiar pleasure you derive from being unhappy. <laughs> Observe the compulsion to talk or think about it or fix it. See, it gives you a task. It gives you someone to be angry at today. It gives you energy to do your work. Anger really works. It's great energy. It gets me through many of the days of my life. Huh? Now, the resistance will cease if you make it conscious. And so uh, that's what uh, Tolle says, and I think he's right. And I wanted to quote that at the beginning because... That's largely what we're doing today, is, is exposing the demon by saying, as Jesus always did at every exorcism, show yourself. We would say today, bring it to consciousness. Once it's even partially conscious, the game's over, at least in part. <laughs> Once you see how silly this is, why do you keep beating yourself on the head and thinking that the, you know, that the effect is going to be different. Huh? It's going to always keep being the same because it's the way you process reality. Now, I'm going to take an, another time to just keep talking general because if I do a lot of the general talk, when I get into the specific numbers, they're going to make a lot more sense. I'd also like to correlate what I'm going to try to say today with what I've said in other places about the true self, false self. I know some of you were at that conference and that's out on tapes too, but I, I want to say that now because I, in this teaching, would like to correlate this with true self, false self instead of what I did on my first set of tapes 20 years ago where I called them the redeemed and the compulsive. And those words are still okay, but the word redeemed still uh, connotes uh, too churchy language for some people. But I'm going to say the true self is really the whole self, what I described earlier as good and bad. And that's on a continuum with the false self. But this does not make the false self bad. It's, this is the container that you use to start learning from. That's all. Got it? And you're never going to kill the total false self, nor should you. All right? it, it, you've just got to learn how to use it, remember? We're going to use the devil to get to God, but it isn't really the devil. It's, here's where language breaks down. So uh, formally, I call this the compulsive self, if you like that. And I call this the redeemed self. And in each of these numbers, you're somewhere on a continuum between freedom and compulsiveness at, at any one point. And I don't think it's a straight line. That once you get it, you stay there. There have been times where I thought, gosh, I'm really beyond my one. I'm not a one. And then next month, I'm back into it again. It just, it just never goes away. It, it just takes new forms. And in fact, the older you get, it just takes more cleverly disguised forms. That's all. It's it real clever at hiding itself. I would say that only the true self is strong enough to let go of the false self. And that's why this is inherently a spiritual system. Without what I would call some initial God encounter, some falling into the larger self, who you are in God and who God is in you, the little tiny self, the little Richard self, is not secure enough, content enough, uh, happy enough to let go of this. It, it needs all these games too much. But the true self just doesn't need to be famous or doesn't need to be rich or doesn't need to be good looking to be happy. You've, you've found it at a deeper level and you, you can let go of all those external things. You see why we're just set up in our country for huge cultural problems because basically we've got a, a giant system of advertising and merchandising that entirely sells people in the false self. And uh, boy, when that starts falling apart for this, let's say, the baby boomer generation, what are they going to do? It's frightening, really, because they will create more and more control freak systems, more and more compelling, compulsive systems to get what they want, 
because uh, this, the false self is so needy, so absolutely needy, moment by moment by moment. And we're seeing this in the neurotic character of so much of our public life, that the, the self needs constant adulation, needs constant affirmation, needs constant promotion, needs constant money to tell itself that it is something which shows by definition that it isn't something yet. It's only the false self that would want all of that. So um, I, I do think in that sense, the anagram is inherently religious language. Uh, it, it is prepared to, to tell you that the only way out of your, your anagram compulsion is by some kind of authentic religious experience. Some kind of authentic God experience is the only thing that will secure you enough to allow you to be insecure. Right? That's all. Nothing else will. So the, the true self is the non-needy, non-compulsive, non-unconscious self that emerges from conscious union with God. It's really, if you want an earlier, rather constant word for it, it's the soul. <laughs> And, we, and the soul is given. It's not created. It's the place within you where God objectively abides and has nothing to do with your performance or your worthiness. It's just there. Now your readiness to participate in it, to enjoy it, is a different thing. The false self is the psychological self, the past self created by what you have done and what has been done to you by others. I, I think we will continue to be a litigious society, suing people and all this, because everybody else made me do it. And it's mother's fault, and it's his fault and her fault, instead of finally saying, I am what I am, good and bad. And even this wound that I carry, there's no point in blaming anybody for it. Now I carry it. It's my wound. Right? And I better deal with it. And you can sue for $10 million. Right? And that isn't going to change the nature of your soul. In fact, it might well confirm you in your righteousness, your superiority, and your supposed purity. That my abuser was the impure person. I'm the pure person. You see how this even knocks politically correct thinking? Huh? that you can divide the world into perfect bad people and perfect good people. I am now participating in this badness. Yes, maybe it was that person's fault. Maybe that person rightfully needs to be restrained. But don't think that by restraining him, I've solved my soul problem, right? I still have to do my growing up. And we are caught in a huge kind of victimology today that is getting us, in my opinion, nowhere because it's always outside the self that the problems of the self are trying to be resolved through changing other people, suing other people, hating other people, or killing other people through our wars. So the, uh, the true self is non-acquired. The false self is the acquired self. And yet what I want to say, brothers and sisters, it's that acquired self that you're attached to, damn it. <laughs> damn it. And I use damn it rightly, all right? Whereas the soul, the non-acquired self, which is indestructible, which is the basis for all of your joy and all of your security, that for some terrible reason you're not attached to, right? And that's even more the more secular our society becomes. The false self is who I think I am and have learned to need to be. It all has to do with the thinking. The, I might also say, uh, no offense to anybody, but the, the uh, false self, the acquired self, is the talkative self. It talks too much. It's always got to... And there's a place for telling your story. There's a place for describing it all. But don't think that by more describing, right? <laughs> by 10 more hours with a therapist in, in describing my inner states, you're going to get to the true self in many ways it attaches you even more because you've spent so much damn time talking about it, right? <laughs> and, and what characterizes the true self is silence. It's beyond words. I, I don't need to prove it to anybody. I don't need to defend it to anybody. I, I don't need to find the right words. And I, I would almost use that as a litmus test. The more you're capable of creative silence, 
I don't need to fill every moment with chatter, with more talk. You know? I think you're moving more toward the true self. And the false self, the, the, the words are almost a way of shoring me up, uh, of validating me, of asserting me, of saying, I'm significant here, notice me. Uh, my words are good, or whatever it might be. Here I am, Mr. Talk himself, saying this. You know? <laughs> always, always talking, but that's precisely how I got to see it, you know, that, that I got to know this talking is not good for me, which is why, uh, in terms of my own soul, why, because I'm in the public forum, I need to be a hermit as much as possible on the other side, huh? where I don't talk and I stop talking because this talking too much defines me as significant, as smart, as, as wise, or all these self-images that I can take on myself or you can project onto me. Huh? The true self is beyond words. It doesn't need them. Now, remember, I've got to repeat one more time, you don't kill the false self that only enhances it if you try to kill it. I'm going to give you three steps. First step, you disidentify with it. And we're going to try to uh, facilitate that disidentification today by exposing it for the silliness that it is. But I want you to say that you disidentify with it largely by observation, not judgment. This is crucial. See, observation creates what we call the subject-object split. You have to teach this in Contemplation 101, where I now stand over here and I watch my thinking mind. <clears throat> I watch my stream of consciousness, and I see it almost as an objective observer. <clears throat> we call it a free witness or a fair witness. He, he witnesses to it fairly, not judging it good or bad, just Oh, oh, that's what's happening. So, oh, that's what I'm doing. And then you start seeing, for example, how often you do the same thing. Which is why Eckhart Tolle says 93% of human thought is repetitive and useless. That you tend to have three or four patterns by the time you're middle age, and you just run those patterns into the ground. And those neural grooves take over by the time you're my age, and you just keep thinking the same thing over and over again. That's why most people aren't very interesting to talk to. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> they aren't. It's, it's the same canned response, same canned response. Always fear, always caution. You know, she's a six, you know. Uh, it's always self. But a, a redeemed six or a, a true self six, you'll sense a freshness, a liberation, a something that that is much larger than fear, and, and you recognize they've so disidentified with it, you know what? They actually are better at overcoming fear than the rest of us. That's the amazing thing that happens. Huh? You're, you're, the overcoming of your sin will become your strongest gift. Huh? Threes are lovers of integrity to an amazing degree. Just, I want to do it honestly. I want to be, be truthful. Huh? One of my greatest friends back in Cincinnati, he was like a son to me. He'd always come to me and say, Richard, don't let me bullshit. Don't let me bullshit. Uh, and threes are masters of bullshit, as are eights, you know. Uh, but but they, uh, he, he knew he could do it so well, he could sell himself. And see, what threes do is they sell you themselves, which is usually easy to do because they're almost always good looking. You know? And then after they've sold you themselves, then they sell you their product, you know, and they got you, you know, they got you. They're always salesmen because they're naturally good at it. Why shouldn't they be? But then when they've seen that sometimes they've sold the wrong thing or they've sold themselves instead of the truth, they, they move toward this endless desire for integrity and truth. But that only comes after the disidentification. So we call this also the watching it with the third eye, the fair witness of the third eye, to see yourself objectively, I got to repeat it one more time, without judgment. And you who were raised in the church, that's very hard to do, very hard, because you want to give it a moral connotation, good, bad, up, down. Uh, worthy of grace, worthy of condemnation, or so, just stop it, just stop it, you know? That's all an ego trip. The, the ego needs to position everything and put it in a pecking order. The soul doesn't. 
Believe me on that. The soul does not need to position everything up and down in terms of better, best. She's better looking. She's not so good looking. So I don't want to see her soul, which is what exactly happens. I can't see her soul because I'm so trapped at good lookingness, which is the, the superficial false self. So you disidentify. Step two, and this is where faith and prayer come in. You have to identify with another source and another energy. You have to find another ground on which to stand. What Archimedes, give me a place to stand and a lever and I can move the whole world. I got to have a different place to stand than my Richard self and its momentary hurts. I just got humiliated. Now, if I just sit here inside of Richard and do a pity party, that someone just humiliated me, all right? Uh, you're, you're a trapped person, all right? No truth will come from that moment. No grace will come from that moment. No liberation for yourself or anybody else. You've got to disidentify. I'm doing the pity party thing, all right? Second, I've got to stand in a larger self. We call it falling into the hands of God or, or handing it over to God. Use your religious language that you use. So most people, you know what most people's language is? I prayed. That's what they're saying. I prayed, God help me. That's good. I mean, that's what you're asking for. I can't do this now. I'm trapped inside my feelings of hurt. I can't get out of it. God help me. Help me to say, speak civilly and even with grace back to this person who seemed to just make fun of me. <laughs> You know, it's hard to do. Sometimes you have to do it real quickly. So you ha <laughs> have to hand it over to God and hand yourself over to God. You have to stand in a different place. Then thirdly, you take back, this is going to feel like a surprise. You take back the appropriate energy of the false self and integrate it into a single eye. And you do so from one center of operation, without judgment or without inner conflict. That is the peace and contentment you see in the saints. Because you're not fighting the wound anymore. You're not rejecting the wound. You just suffered the wound. Do you understand? This is subtle. Don't fall asleep now. All right. You just, you suffered the ego humiliation. She just sort of made fun of me. Right? And it does hurt. Who of us can deny that? And, and it'll take years of practice to, to, to compartmentalize and to know how to move apart, but to also move back. And I've got to say that. You know why. You good therapists know why. I'm not talking about a game of denial. I'm I've still got to own the hurt. Huh? As some say, don't forgive too quickly or too glibly or too soon. <laughs> It still does hurt, but the disidentification allows it not to possess you. There's an I here that can have the feeling. Right? And you've got to find that I, that autonomous I hidden with Christ in God, the larger self. And that self, the humiliation just rolls off your back like water off a duck's back. It doesn't hurt you. It doesn't have much power to hurt you. But the false self is highly hurtable. Now, you're going to have to practice that for years, right? Don't think you'll learn that today. Because you've become attached and practiced in the first form of the knee-jerk reaction. She kicks me, I kick her right back. And then you both remain in your false self. Huh? You both remain in your tiny self and your worst self. And the world never grows up, which is our world that we live in. So um, it's, it's almost a kind of the third space, uh, the moving back, is what some have called the effort of non-effort. You, you stop trying at that point to figure it out, to psychologize it, to justify it, to rationalize it, to legitimate why you're right and she's wrong or whatever it might be. You, you come to this place of a kind of uh, surrender. Yeah, that it is what it is, and it, it's what is that will bring me to God. And it's what is that will always teach me, not what isn't. <laughs> See, we spend all our time fighting things that, that don't exist but should exist. Huh? 
and it's what exists. Maybe it's the deepest meaning of the incarnation. It finally keeps us and brings us to God. Anything which keeps you from enjoying and living in the present moment, we call it resistance, uh, will, will, will leave you in the split self. Our word for the split self was the diabolical self. Diabolain in Greek means to be thrown into two. The diabolical is always the split self. So you have to come back to the true self, which is always the one self, who I am. But now there's an ability to stand back, look at it, not judge it, not hate it, and therefore to, to reconnect with it, but now not to be controlled by it. It's an art form, I have to admit, and I don't think a high percentage of people work at it too long because it's too much work. Right? This is the real work. And, and what we've done is stop people. I'll use a graphic example. Just don't look at Playboy. You know, so the, no playboys in my life or playgirls, no, no dirty pictures, just keep dirty pictures over here, all right? And so uh, what we end up with is willpower Christianity. It's Prometheus as our God, not Jesus, right? <laughs> Who suffers the, the reality instead of compartmentalizing it permanently. He, he owns it and, and lets it own him, as it were, but is not possessed by it. Maybe own isn't the really best word. Someone said, the last thing humans will let go of is their suffering. We manufacture a set of expectations about ourselves that are required for us to be happy. And you know you do that. You probably had them for coming here today. And you're going to like this day or not like this day, depending on how much I fulfill those expectations. <laughs> now, I can understand that. We all do that. But know when you do that, when you have a mental set of what I need to be happy, you're basically going to live an unhappy life. Right? You, you have set yourself up for constant, continuous unhappiness because your ego is imposing its template on reality. And when that doesn't come back to you, you will be unhappy. You see what power you've put outside yourself? <laughs> Everybody else is in control of your life. That's why all three of these are so... You're all being jerked around by everybody else instead of drawing your life from within. That I define my happiness. I define my truth, which can only be done, in my opinion, inside of the true self. Expectations will never be met. You will just keep hammering yourself on the head and blaming other people the rest of your life. When you are foundationally joyful, when you're doing it right, you, you will have momentarily at least, probably not long term, but momentarily you will have overcome your compulsiveness. You will be living, frankly, by a life not your own. That's it. <laughs> You'll be living by a life not your own. You will be, to use our English phrase very well, you'll be living, you're a larger than life person at that moment. You really are. Uh, there is a knower within you. There is a lover within you who knows who you really are and loves who you really are. That's the soul, if you just want to use that term, instead of the, the true self. And when, when you can let that do the knowing and that do the loving, uh, you will be content. You will, you will live, you will be able to live without disguise, sort of a naked, simple, and clean life where you can enter into the pain of the world, but you don't uh, let it carry you. You don't let it define you or possess you. Now, back to the three centers again. Because there are clearly these three centers to the human person, they also seem to take three forms. That's how we get nine. And I know it still sounds a little clever. Huh? There is what I'm going to call, what I already called, forgive me, the compulsive center number, the double compulsion. The center point is pure compulsion, the three, the six, and the nine. They are actually most masked from themselves. It's very hard for them to be converted. They have the hardest time getting out of it in a certain way because they are so totally enmeshed in it. 
Life is a constant shock wave of heart. For the three, a constant shock wave of body gut. For the nine, a constant shock wave of head trips for the six. The three shock points, you can just call them that if you want, where even the wings, as I said, confirm their compulsiveness. <clears throat> the three is so trapped in their feeling world that, that what they do to get out of this feeling world is they move toward, toward the world of action in the three, service in the two. <laughs> it, it ironically shows that this world of feeling is so confusing to them. And they don't know how to put boundaries up to it. Which are mine and which are hers? And who am I? They're constantly asking. The enters into a world of aesthetic enhancement. <laughs> I don't know all these feelings floating around. I'll just make it pretty, right? I'll just, they're into decoration, right? They're into aesthetic sublimation through words and, and colors. And, and it works for them. The, for the four, you, you don't understand a four until you know that the metaphor is actually more real than the reality. The, the rightly chosen phrase or word is better than, than the thing that the word points to. I don't care about the thing in itself, the ding on sick. It's just the symbol. Oh, they die for symbols, you know. They just love this world of fantasy because it's their only way. You see, the symbol can control that, that endless floating feeling in their life. So there's three different dances. In a certain sense, uh, well, since I'm on the, the heart space, the three is the pure compulsion. I'm going to call the preceding number in each case the obvious compulsion. You see it too, and you just know that they're filled with feelings. You actually don't know it so much with the three. That's why they themselves can't see it. And they sometimes don't look like heart people. They're efficiency experts. Huh? It's, that's what I mean, that it's masked even from themselves and from you. In the preceding number, it's the obvious uh, compulsion, if you will. They're obviously heart people. In the following number, in this case, the four, it's the conflicted number. A conflicted number. In other words, they've created a little disguise and a little game, even from themselves for a, a clever way of controlling their feelings or their head or their gut. That'll become clearer as the day goes on. This is very, very important to understand. That, that in each case it's true and why as we go around the circle, the numbers pattern into one another. I still don't understand the genius of this thing. Uh, why why it's, it could be so cleverly defined. And yet, not only do they meld into one another and overlap into one another and participate in one another, but what you're going to see if we get enough time by the end of the day, uh, the flip number will be right next to you, too, to balance you out. Something that's exactly the opposite. The eights are the ultimate hard people, and right next to them, they got the ultimate happy people, you know, the seven. It's always true as you go around the whole number. So the previous number is the focused and obvious form of the compulsion. Utterly committed to heart, head, or gut. The five is such a head person, always into their words and ideas and theories and ideologies and books and explanations. So, uh, the, the, the eight is so trapped in his body response, that's why he's just kicking back all the time. He doesn't know how to get out of his instinctual self, his body self. And, and so he takes it out on you, literally. <laughs> Uh, because it's too much. It really is too much. The uh, conflicted numbers, to run back to them just quickly again, the two is obvious feeling. The five, as I just mentioned, is obvious head. Head, head, head. The eight is obvious body. The one, we are conflicted gut. I get that constant shock wave of, of reality. That's just too much, too much. Don't know how to handle it. We take it all in in a holistic way, and it is too much. The way I've decided to handle it is I'm going to sort of reform it and fix it. Do you understand? 
we're natural reformers. That's why I'm here today, reforming you. Do you see I'm being a one? We're natural teachers. We're rearranging it. We're always rearranging the room, you know, and, and making it more clean and more perfect. Mr. Clean is our patron saint. Did you know that? <laughs> And it's our little way. We can't clean up the whole of America, so I'll clean my bathroom. And, uh, and that's my one little area of being in control. Uh, it, but do you see the conflict there? I'm fighting my gut response to reality. Whereas the eight just goes with his gut response for good and for evil. So conflicted is the preceding number. Pure number is in the middle. And the obvious is... Oh, did I say preceding? Yeah, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah, said it wrong, said it wrong. The obvious is the preceding, and the conflicted is the following. Yeah. You got it. Uh, okay, the, the preceding number in each case, like here, is the obvious energy. It's so visible. These, the fives and the twos and the eights, you can pretty much pick them out, you know? Uh, the twos even talk with seductive, sweet voices. You know? they're, they're on the make all the time. They're always on the make. You know? All of life is a seduction game, do you see? If you haven't been made fun of yet, you will be. I will. <laughs> so I don't want to pick on any number more than another. The, the following number in each case, like me as a one, were the conflicted people. Um, the seven say something about him or her. You'd never, to look at a seven, think they're a head person. It's the most clever disguise possible. I mean, they're just going to Disneyland every other week. They're dressed in primary colors. They drive yellow cars. They, they, they're just so happy, and, and everything's upbeat and positive, and the world is just wonderful, and they refuse to see the downside of anything. But do you see the utter conflict that's going on there? They're actually head tripping constantly about what could go wrong. They've got a strong six wing. They're scared in many ways because all uh, uh, head people are scared. And they found the most clever disguise for fear possible. It's just whistle in the dark. And they go through the whole of their life whistling. You know? And you get sick of the whistling after a while. You don't believe the whistling after a while because it's too much whistling. And you know that they never face the dark. They hate the dark. I have a friend who's a seven. He went to the Passion of Christ last week, and he emailed me, and he said, the last hour, I just sat with my hands over my eyes. And can you imagine seeing this bloody body of Jesus for a seven? That's just, it's hell itself. He, just, he said, I just wanted to run out of the theater just screaming <laughs> because I was with two priests. He said, I couldn't leave, so I just sat there. I covered my eyes. <laughs> That's the seven, all right? So we're all conflicted. We're trying to reform the world because we can't bear this much reality. There's that T.S. Eliot line. Mankind cannot bear, humankind cannot bear very much reality. That's true of all nine types. We've all found a way to block too much reality. Julian of Norwich, again, to get back to my favorite, she says... That the reason that God does not want us to sin, it's not that God's created a list of good things and bad things. If you do the bad things, God doesn't like you. Right? She has such a brilliant psychology. She says, the reason God doesn't want us to sin is that when you do sin, which is really just stupid things, it prevents you from seeing yourself as God sees you. In other words, it makes you hate yourself. That's the only reason. God wants you to see yourself as God sees you, right? God wants you to see yourself. And when you do stupid, self-destructive things, you can't see yourself as God sees you. You get into self-hatred. It's just that's the only reason. God is, just wants you to see yourself as God sees you. So when, when you can flow with the good and the true and the beautiful, the positive and not the negative in the good sense, um, then you can uh, honor this divine image that you are. You can recognize this divine image that you are. So it seems that all sin, or compulsiveness, as we're calling it here, comes from an initial self-hating. And, and, and uh, plus, they also tear down the trust between peoples, Julian says. We don't see the divine image in one another either, because we see she's being so selfish. And that it's hard for me to 
to see that she's an image of God. So she says so beautifully, part of the reason we try to be good and true and beautiful is to make it easier for other people to see God in us. That's all. <laughs> Not to make ourselves wonderful and famous, but just, you know, my novice master told us that when I was 19. He said, you don't just have an obligation in the religious community to be loving, but to make it somewhat easy for the other friars to love you. Right? <laughs> Don't make it so hard for them to love you. You know, make it. A, of course, that just appealed to my goody two shoes one instinct. You know? <laughs> That's probably the last thing I needed to hear. So all that happened was my badness went underground. It didn't go away. You know. So in other words, sin is that which blinds us much more than anything that makes us unworthy. Just get rid of that worthiness game, right? Because your worthiness comes from your soul anyway. Do you understand? You didn't create your worthiness. It's a gift from God. <laughs> That's what makes you fall in love with God. So stop the worthiness game and recognize that the, the core of the unmasking of sin is, is a matter of, of letting you see your blindness. And, and we are, uh, are blind on that level. Once you can see correctly and that, that the good includes the non-good, then it becomes so much easier to love, so much easier to accept and to fight and to stop fighting, excuse me, everybody else. St. Augustine says at the beginning of his Confessions, which is probably the first psychological document the world ever had, he starts with, I was not with you because I was not with myself. I was not with you because I was not with myself. It's right at the beginning of the Confessions. Brilliant, brilliant. Yeah, I don't think you can be with God <laughs> until you are first with yourself, which means you stop eliminating what you have judged to be unacceptable. But we're gonna, we gotta still see how that is blinding you or how something is trapping you. So I'm gonna define discernment as a trained awareness. A trained awareness of when an energy is true and centered and grounded, the true self, and when an energy is uncentered, ungrounded, and false self. That's all. And that's, you can be trained in that. Although I'll bet every one of you in this room, women tend to be better at it, uh, can read, you can tell when a person is a grounded, solid, real human being, that they're coming from their center. And so you've all got a foundation for reading this, but it usually hasn't been sophisticated. We could call the Enneagram homeopathic healing in a certain thing, that you are healed by the same thing that wounds you. Remember that? Moses holding up this snake which bit the people and says, those who look on the snake will be healed. Became the pharmacist symbol, very good symbol. But it's actually a symbol of homeopathic healing that you've actually got to eat a little bit. <laughs> it's all inoculations are based on the same thing. You nurses and doctors know that. You give a little piece of the disease to the person, help them deal with that little piece of the disease, and ironically, that creates the protection against the disease. There it is, written into human biology, written into the nature of the universe. You can't just get rid of it. Huh? You make friends with your shadow as it were. You tame your demons, as we said at the beginning. Moses insisted that the people bitten by the snake look upon it. And of course, then the cross became the new snake, the new wounding. We said, whoever looks upon it will come to recognize what they're doing to goodness. The ultimate good one, Jesus for us, becomes the crucified one because that's what humanity does to goodness. It kills it. It, it hates it, it tortures it, it attacks it. It's a, you know, the whole conflict that you see in the movie, The Passion, between religion and the good one is the archetypal pattern of, of how religion itself can be fooled. And how religion itself, which is supposedly the best thing, very often ends up being the worst thing when it doesn't learn how to see. So what we're saying in all this, if you've missed it so far, is that you cannot deny your basic personality, right? Here's incarnational spirituality. You can't. You are who you are, 
And that's what God loves, and that's what God uses. But you've heard me enough now in these first hours that I'm not saying that in a glib, follow your bliss way, all right? It's, it's much more difficult than that. The disidentification, the moving back into it without judgment. You cannot deny your basic personality. You must go on the same path for your recovery that you went on the fall. You will find spiritual growth by going back through the same experiences, ironically, that caused your problems in the first case. Right? But now you do them differently. That's why people can't let go of those primal hurts. If they were wounded by their father, they keep wanting to find a good father. Huh? If they were wounded by their mother, they keep being attracted to older women and relating to older women. Because where it was done wrong, I want to do it right. right? And I want to find one good mother. To, uh, to uh, you know, heal the wound where I had the bad mother. Uh, that's just naming it. I hope we've come to see it. Actually, modern psychology has helped us to see it. So a seven, for example, just to use them as an example, does not become anything other than a seven. It's precisely through joy and happiness and seeing the risen life in all things, that they will come to God. But now it's not the resurrection on this side of the crucifixion. It's the resurrection on the other side of the crucifixion. And that's the redeemed resurrection. You follow me? But it's still joy. My father was a seven. Huh? Had a dementia the last 10 years of his life. But I remember walking in the home, you know, and he, he could barely stand at the end. He lived till 89, but... He jumped to his feet, smile from ear to ear, you know, and uh, call me by name, of course, and run toward me. I had a good father. Uh, but part of the reason I think he was so good is he was a seven. He never saw the bad side of any of us, you know. <laughs> he, uh, it, it took a seven to uh, live a whole life of 50-some years with my mother, who was an eight, you know. <laughs> and uh, you see... We tend to, to uh, very often, you'll see this by the end of the day, it's amazing. I don't want to make this too fatalistic or deterministic, but you amazingly often marry the person right next to you because they are your flip and your opposite. Not always, but I'd say 60% of the time. They balance you out in some ways, and they really do. My mom and my dad balanced me out. My mother was always demanding. My father was always forgiving. You know? And together, it worked in, in, <laughs> in our lives. I, at least I hope it did. Now, I want to say one more thing before we start moving into the individual types. How it's hard for each of us to live in the now in different ways. Because I am convinced that, that the purest form of spirituality is the ability to accept the sacrament of the present moment and to find God in the present moment. Gut people only live in the now in a shocked, overwhelmed way that, that makes them substitute, as I said before, their judgments for real contact or real presence. They are always carrying all kinds of unfelt, unprocessed emotion. Remember, shock wave every three minutes. You just can't process that much. It's way too much for eights, nines, and ones. Everything is an overwhelming perception for us huh, in our whole body. So we control it. Uh, and therefore, we have the hardest time living in the now. That's why I have to go apart. That's why I have to practice contemplation. Uh, it's the only way for me to accept the now and to, to, to process it in some way, ironically, by not processing it, by forgiving it and allowing it to be. They're continually being blown away by the, the strong gust of wind of the present, which is why the nine just withdraws and stops feeling. I just, it's too much. Can't process it. Can't deal with it. It's really a wonderful survival technique. You know? Heart people have a very hard time living in the now because they are reacting to and carrying and trying to please everybody else's concerns. And they move toward action. Heart people have a very hard time with contemplation, with silence. It isn't because their way of overcoming it ironically is action. 
Ours is to make judgments to control it. Heart people do something, serve you, decorate you, <laughs> or make you an efficiency expert in some way. Huh? So they're always processing the past, which is why it's hard for hard people to forgive. Very hard. They just keep replaying how you offended them last month or last year, or 10 years ago. <laughs> and they jump into anxiety about the future. Neither place is the now, which is where everything happens. They're trapped in a flurry of now feelings, but the now feelings are not theirs. They're everybody else's. So you can see the wisdom of meditation. Why well, you've just got to keep, let go, let go. This feeling comes along and says, feel me, feel me. No, not now. Don't judge it. Don't hate it. Just put it on a boat, as we say, and let it go down the river. Don't have to feel that feeling now. Don't have to foster that feeling. Don't have to feed that feeling. Most people, that's the name of the game, feeding their feelings. <laughs> and soon they are possessed by a demon. That's the real meaning of being possessed. Now, head people are stuck in the present. They look like, and they, you know, they love to sit quietly in meditation and contemplation, all right? <laughs> but they do contemplation in an information gathering way, all right? <laughs> Which does not allow them really to be present either. They have to withdraw in some sense to deal with all of the thoughts, data, and emotions that they're constantly trying to make sense out of. So, so they, they like maybe silence, they like to withdraw, uh, but their problem is that they keep thinking inside of the now huh? and keep processing inside of the now. So again, you can see why all great teachers of prayer are telling you to let go of your feelings, right? <laughs> to let, let go of your addiction to your thoughts. And even to us body people, uh, to try to sit in a way that is more holistic than just body awareness. Huh? And believe it or not, breathing can do the same, where it moves me to the more holistic self instead of just the body self. How do we resist? Gut people resist aggressively in a way that frankly, and I've hurt people by this in my life, our quick responses are, will come across as quick and brusque and absolute and even harsh. Because what we're trying to do is stop the flood of, of perception that's coming toward us. So if you, if you catch a gut person on the run, when they've got a, a lot of uh, tasks in hand, you're not going to get their best response. And you're going to take an offen offense from it, huh? but you don't know that you have caused it. Right? That's why we're all by, of course, if you don't know someone well, you don't know that. Huh? But they're saying, stop the flood of perception. I can't take anymore right now. The eight will push you back. Right? The nine will, will simply sort of glaze over. <laughs> And we ones will try to fix you or change you, you know, <laughs> terrible. Heart people resist in a way, frankly, that often feels manipulative. They will often feel invasive, intrusive. They'll often feel high maintenance. Like, uh, like help me deal with my feelings. Give me time. Notice me. Uh, they'll demand to be noticed very often. Uh, because they are, by definition, very needy people. Sorry to have to say it, but twos, threes, and fours have a lot of needs, especially on the emotional level, for response, you see, for being taken care of, for being admired, for being liked, for being thought to be artistic, creative, special, whatever. So I think that's pretty much all of my overview and I hope it's enough that will now allow us to move in to individual spaces uh, with, with some degree of preparation. How many minutes do we have, John? Oh, ten. oh we have 10. Now, it's no surprise. Uh -oh. oh, didn't I say that? I'm, oh, forgive me, forgive me. Mayor Culpa, the good boy wasn't good. He didn't do it right. <laughs> Had people resist by being, of course, aloof and withdrawn. They go inside in some way and ruminate with their perceptions and their ideology 
try to revalidate what their existing ideology is, which is why they tend to be intellectual snobs. They tend to be uh, conservative because everything has to go by the previous paradigm that is in place in my head. But now I'm going to talk right out of the opposite side of my mouth. When you get a five, a six, or a seven who can really take risks and think creatively and do some good head work, uh, they can be the most creative revolutionaries of all. But left to themselves in their compulsive form, your, your five and your six especially tend to be intellectual snobs, curmudgeons, you know, uh, always pulling everything back into the, when the truth really existed back in 1950, you know, which just happened to be when they were a boy, you know. Or uh, if they studied the Greeks, it's when the Greeks were the real philosophers. Uh, you see this in a lot of conservative religion. It's these head people seeking control. And uh, they tend to be very attracted to religion because it gives you that existing ideology which reassures you that you're right. And that's the overwhelming need of the head person. Reassurance on a head level that they are in control and they are right. The form it takes is what we call fundamentalism, and it's happening all over the world. If it's true that 50% of the human race are sixes, you can see we got a problem. And if we don't expose, in the good sense, the nature of fear and, and the utterly binding and blinding quality of fear, I think the world is, is going to be led down all kind of roads by fear-based people who have never uh, had to face fear for the demon that it is, but it's always been called virtue. Okay, we do have a couple minutes of just overall questions on anything I've tried to say up to now. And then after this, we will start going into the numbers one by one. Yes? Mm -hmm. You uh, mentioned earlier in your talk about strengths and gifts. Do you find those to be sort of the same or are they sort of different? Or Strengths. Uh, Strengths and gifts. Oh, well, you know, I could do that before the break. I bet we got time. Uh, just to name them. That would be nice. Hmm? Uh, now, remember that I'm going to, because I'm coming from the faith background, I'm going to first of all correlate these to the classic capital sins. There were seven. We added two, the three and the six, fear and deceit. And is it an accident or not? that fear and deceit tend to be the demons, in my opinion, that are controlling the West. Because we never recognize the three and the six as capital sins, right? And we'll explain that as we go through. But let me start with the one. Our capital sin, our weakness, there's a lot of different words used for it. The best word for it is resentment. I'm not going to describe them in great length. The capital name was anger, of course. The, the opposite of that, which I hope you'll see in me sometimes today, I hope it's there, is in fact the exact opposite, serenity. That I'm actually better at overcoming anger than the rest of you because it's been my demon all my life, do you see? And I'm sick of it, and I don't believe it, and I don't trust it, and I don't always follow it. When I'm my best self, I'm going to be the most serene of all of you. Isn't that wonderful? I mean, for those of you who are ones, that gives you a little hope, doesn't it? <laughs> the sin of the two, now this takes, they all take description, is pride. It's not the usual sense of vanity or conceit. It's a sense of far outweighing their importance in your life. Right? <laughs> They ingratiate themselves and make you need them and then hate you if you don't need them enough. Do you understand? <laughs> that grandiosity of ego, that constantly pushing themselves into institutions and relationships as aren't I important? Aren't I wonderful? Aren't I absolutely essential to the task? My love is saving you. Uh, that, in fact, becomes their blindness. When they face it, I always say, they, uh, they cry for three days. It's very humiliating for a two to face that self-centeredness of their love. And they flip into their greatest gift, which is humility. I know that in a lot of my friends who are twos. They actually can end up 
becoming more humble than most people because they've seen the phoniness of their love. And for some reason, for the soul, nothing is more humiliating than to see the phoniness of your love. It's, you want to cry. You just, oh, damn it. I thought I was being so good, and I wasn't being good to you at all. I was being good to me. Huh? Ooh, that's painful. And the pain is so great in the good sense that it makes them into very humble people. If they can keep recognizing that fallibility of their love. The three, which was one of the denied, it wasn't in the original capital sins, is deceit. This doesn't mean they go around telling lies, right? <laughs> they wouldn't be so gross as to do that. It just means they embellish the truth. They put their best foot forward. Why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you show your best looking face? We're all threes in that sense, huh? We, we, we try to, you know, embroider the truth and we try to hide the shadow. We, they're natural salesmen without even trying without even working at it. They know how to sell a product and tell you what's great about it. But again, first of all, they sell themselves. I mentioned before that when they face that, they become great lovers of integrity and truth. And that's their virtue, which is exactly the opposite of their deceit. Yes? Integrity or truth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. That they become lovers of integrity and truth. It may be time for one more, at least the four. Uh, this is, again, revealing the subtlety of the four in many ways. The, the sin of the four is envy. It will take longer time to describe it this afternoon. But they have an immediate eye. It's spontaneous it, for class, for taste, for, for that looks good, that sounds good, that smells good. That, they, they can't help it. They just, they're classy people, you know. And, you know, it, it's the French who've made an art form out of it, you know. It's the Japanese in the Orient, the same thing. You just go to Japan and you just think you're in a constant art museum. How, how can any one country be so beautiful? You know? Beauty is paramount to the four. And, uh, and they can't help it. <laughs> Now, their virtue, when they stop getting into this envy of people who are, oh, she's prettier than I am, or he's more artistic than I am, or he's getting promoted in the job of writing and I'm not, oh, they, that's hard for them to accept. Anybody who's classier than they are, more talented than they are, getting promoted by reason of their gift, and I'm not. Uh, and it can really blind them. There's many novels and movies in history about the rage of the rejected four, right? Whose art form is not appreciated or whose art form is not loved. When they can weep over that, they flip into what we call equanimity, a kind of even-souledness. That's literally what it means. A kind of ability, and this also creates even greater art in them, that subtlety of good and bad, that subtlety of darkness and light. That's, uh, and that's why they're masters of subtlety. They face subtlety in themselves instead of looking for, you know, a total perfect artist and now I'm totally bad, a total failure. They have to learn that the truth is somewhere in between. And when they learn to honor that truth and love that truth that's in between, they in fact emerge with their greatest gift. So let's take another five-minute stand-up break and we'll start on the numbers as such in the next session. <laughs>